we were driving down the road and we see some cows or some horses you know, out in the field and we think we, we want to do that field, but we want to put those animals in there. But you all know that, you know, as soon as you pull everything out of the car and you set it up, well, the horses are long gone. But if there's cows, they'll, they'll, they're a little bit more uh, forgiving and they will, they'll hang around until you get completely set up and you put paint on your brush. And then they'll turn around and they'll look out over their shoulder and they'll say, see ya. And so what do we do with that? What I want to do is, uh, you know, I, I kind of have a plan on what I want to do today. Um, and it may get to be a little bit more too complex for beginners. So if, uh, if that happens, let me know, Eric, and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can take it down a notch. Uh, I know that one of the things that happens with a lot of us artists, uh, you know, the working artists, we know things that we that beginners don't and we forget that there is a big gap between what we know and what they know so uh you know oh, i'll whip you i'll whip you into shape you have no no oh, i appreciate that you know the whole purpose of this is to get everybody to to at least you know find some little nugget that they can uh, uh use and, and you know when they go out in the field so uh and this is kind of coming from my own experience um uh you know when i started doing plein air I did like everybody, I just painted vistas. And then of course you start adding things, you start adding horse, you know, you start adding houses or buildings and then you start doing trees. And, and every time I go out, what I'm looking for is uh, not just something to paint, but I'm looking to find out what I don't know. Uh, you know, I know how to paint a tree, but do I know certain you know, specific details of how to paint a tree? Uh, maybe a better example would be, uh, 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 surf on a beach. Uh, we can see it. You can sit there and watch it all day long, but that doesn't mean that just because you have any, a memory of seeing it, that you're going to be able to construct. It. That's a whole different, uh, uh, you know, that's a different animal. So uh, what I do is I use this time of year, uh, you know, on the off season, I'm not crazy about going out painting in the cold. I, it's just not my thing. And uh, so I'll use this time in studio to figure out how, what, you know, how are these things structured? How can I paint them? Uh, you know, if I wanted to do sunsets and sunrises, which I do occasionally, uh, you know, that's that's a prime example. If anybody's tried to do a sunset or a sunrise, you can't just go out there and watch it and then make it happen. You have to take bring some memory knowledge with you. And, uh, you know, the same thing uh, I find um, applies to if you want to put uh, farm animals into a into a landscape he says you know if you you know you you you, you know you set up your stuff the cows are not going to stay there they're going to wander off uh and horses they don't care anything about about painters and they'll just wander off and you they'll be gone long before you've even put the brush to the canvas so uh so what do you do with that you have to find some sort of uh uh symbol uh and, it, and that's what painting is it's all about making symbols uh, whether, you know, no matter how realistic you do it, you know, even the, the, the folks who come out of the, uh, the academies, when they're, um, you know, they're doing these photorealistic, you know, highly rendered uh, figures or animals or, 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 you know, casts or whatever they're doing, uh, even those, everything that they put on to a flat surface with a pencil or a charcoal is, you know, it's, it's a symbol. It's all symbolism. So well, let's you've got get to, to it. Let's see some symbols, baby. All right, let's do it. All right. Well, one, one of the things that, uh, now what I'm going to do is I've got a panel here and I'm going to be putting things on and wiping things off. So we're not really going to get an end result. Uh, so it's, it might be one of those things that you want to try to put it in your head because we're going to move on to other things. So you're going to be uh, drawing with paint. I'm going to be drawing with paint. What I've done is I've mixed up I've just got some basic size brushes. I got a three quarter inch brush. I got a two inch brush and I've got a, a quarter inch brush that I pulled out of a box. So um, just so I can draw with it. And I mixed up some uh, ivory black and some uh, cad red. Uh, I've been teaching some workshops on the Zorn palette, which, you know, is black and white and cad red and yellow ochre. And so and, I, and one of the combinations I really like is that black and red it was kind of a purple. Uh, so it's going to, I think it'll work. It's very monochromatic. Uh, so we're really not talking about color today. This is going to be about more about form. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, when we were kids, uh, we were five years old, we could draw a horse and we didn't have a problem with it. it you know, we, 
as everybody knows, this is what a horse looks like. It's a four-legged animal. Kind of looks like a helicopter to me. Does it? <laughs> you haven't been drawing horses, have you? <laughs> I just put a so, blade on it. Anyway, we, you know, but but our but when we get to second, by the time we get to second grade and we're eight years old, we say, no, that's not going to cut it. So we start looking. What we do anytime when we're learning to draw, we typically and may not be aware of it, but we are looking at outlines. We look at contours. And, uh, uh, you know, so we think, okay, so a horse has a contour, and I'm just going to do this, and I'm not, this is not going to be real accurate, but you get the idea. Now, we might embellish it more than that, but that's what's going on in our head. We see that. We see shapes. Uh, if you were, if you had a, a group of horses in a field and you really wanted to get a better representation, uh, one way to do that is take a photograph and paint for the photograph. Uh, in fact, that's a great way to uh, do some study. Uh, you know, if you're in studio and take those photographs and paint from those photographs. And what's happening, though, is that contour, you can study that contour and you can see, you know, where the withers is and you can see how it relates to a to a leg. But in the but in if this this animal is out in the field moving around, you have no way of the contours are going to be changing constantly. Uh, I've got an, an example of uh, several years ago. I was down in uh, Texas at a ranch and I was painting, and they had a longhorn steer. And I know cows pretty well, and I thought this is just a big cow with long horns. And uh, it uh, I could get the body on it, and I got the body. I nailed it, but the head I could not figure out. And I'm trying to, as that hit, that that steer is moving its head around, those horns are going, they're going, you know, they're going this way, then they're going this way, then they're going this way. I couldn't figure it out. It was just like it had, uh, you know, it was like it was, uh, you know, like a, a spiral staircase, two spiral staircases going in opposite directions. Uh, and that was a case where I thought, Okay, you know what? I spent three hours on this, went through two rolls of paper towels. I need to go back in studio and figure out how this thing is actually structured. So, and that comes, I run into that all the time. And one of the things that I do that I like, it's, I think people don't realize is that we're raising questions all, you know, painting is all about raising questions and, and, uh, and finding out what the problem is and then trying to find an answer for that question. And, uh, I'm always asking myself, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, have a chicken, I've painted this shape many, many times, the chicken, and you've got a foot coming down. What does, what happens on that foot? Well, you can put grass in there and you can cover it up and you don't have to worry with it. But my question is always, I need to know what that foot looks like. You know, you can you can kind of do this and your guess, but it's not you're not answering the question. So, you know, it's 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 it. I like to think of it as sort of a lifelong uh, pursuit of finding out what does a chicken leg do? Um, and what it actually does is the chicken has three toes. And it has a fourth one on the back. Does it have five legs? Or it doesn't have five toes. It has three. So, and are they webbed? No. Uh, but what has webbed legs or has webbed feet? Seagulls. I do a lot of seagulls. Same foot, basically, but they're webbed. So you can, you know, it's just one of those things that you you constantly should be asking yourself, what don't I know? And again, you can put grass over it and you can cover it up. But what I want to talk about a little bit today is uh, we're going to I'm going to take you back to eighth grade uh, biology class. And if you remember, we're uh, working, seeing how things are structured. All right. I want to know in the comments who actually dissected something in eighth grade and what was it or seventh grade? I dissected. <laughs> yeah, I dissected a frog. We dissected all kinds of things. And, you know, that, I mean, you and I are the same generation where that's what they did. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think they need to. Well, but, let's, uh, let's, yeah. 
uh, you know, that was that was the mo mode of operating. Um, I'm going to do uh, just an example. Let's say you had uh, let's say you had a ladder back chair. Bear with me here. And then let's say that you put a blanket over it. It's obviously a clear blanket. It is a clear blanket. <laughs> let's take, let's think of that chair as a skeleton, a skeleton. Okay. The skeleton on any mammal is going to tell you where, what the contours are going to be. And what this, what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about today is really kind of, kind of just exposing everybody to understanding that, uh, that is part of it. So if you didn't see the chair, you just saw the blanket. You might see that, but you still would know that there must be something underneath it, and it must be probably a chair. And you can guess that it's a ladder back chair. Do you need to know that it's a ladder back chair? No, but you do need to know where the blanket is being affected by the structure underneath. And there's probably something right here. Well, in the same way, a horse, let's say. The skin on a horse is not just floating out there by itself. It is, it is draped over like a blanket over a skeleton. And I'm going to show you how I structure, how I build uh, a horse. And I'm hoping that when I go through this, you'll see that it really isn't as complicated as you might think. Uh, in fact, well, this is coming from the experience. I've been struggling with painting cows and horses for a long time. In fact, during COVID, I, I have a friend who couldn't get out, of course, but I have a friend who has stables. And I went over to her place several times, you know, just to work on my horse anatomy. That's when I got into doing chickens because chickens were their feet and they're a whole lot easier. They only have two legs. Uh, but it dawned on me that, you know, there's... It, it's it's not as complicated as as I, I I would even look at a horse or I would look at a cow and I'd say, well, it's just so complicated. How am I going to draw this thing? It's not that complicated. Um, you know, if you know, let's say let's do this first. Um, a simple symbol for a cow. If let's say it's in a well, let's do this first. Let's say you have. Say you have a landscape. Got some trees, you got a hillside, comes down like this. If it's a small painting, you can actually do this to indicate those cows. Now you might want to need a little bit more than that. Well, you can say, well, let's just put some feet on them or some legs. And maybe you put a neck on it. And basically what you're doing is you're doing a simplified cow. Cows are, cows are interesting because I always think of them like furniture. So what I, what I do, Lon, is... What do uh, you do? Uh, I try, if I'm putting a, a grouping of cows or sheep or something together, I uh -huh. try to define one. One that's yes. going to be kind of closer to the, to the front of the scene so that they're going to assume if that, they can tell that's a sheep, they're going to assume the other white dots are sheep. That's exactly true, and that's because if you can give a little bit of information, uh, you can be loosey goosey. I mean, you can be really kind of vague about all the other animals, but if there's a group of them and one of them reads as a cow, they all read as cow. Uh, that's and that's a smart strategy. My friend Charles White always said a cow is a box with legs. It's that's ex <laughs> that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, you can do this, and you know that. That's a cow, and it works. Uh, the thing of it is that when you, if you make that, if this becomes the feature in your in your uh, composition or a major player, even that's not going to be enough, because where does this leg come out? Does this is this a front leg on the back, or is this a front leg on the you know on the on the back, and this was on the front? You know, you have to know a few things uh, because you can't take. Yeah, let's see here. You see this sometimes. People will put their, their their legs back here. Still reads, but it's not quite right. Uh, 
and sometimes, and I've done this myself, where I have, you know, I put the head really close. Let's do it this way. I made a buffalo. You're just making a big mess. Stay with me. <laughs> you can have with the cow. You put the you can put the head here, but you're guessing, uh, and it's sort of a generic uh, uh, animal. What I want to do is I want to talk about what is inside here. What actually causes these legs to be here? These back legs to be here. What causes this? Okay, so we're going to figure out the skeleton under the blanket. It's the skeleton under the blanket, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so bear with me here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we sometimes also don't realize is that we carry a reference skeleton with us all the time, everywhere we go. It's I always have mine. Yes, exactly. People, uh, I know plein air artists, a lot of times I'll talk to them and I'll say, you know, you need to, it would be very valuable for you to take a figure class. And they say, oh, no, 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 that's too complicated. I can't do that. Um, and it is a complex thing. However, it can be simplified. And I, again, talking in terms of symbols, whenever I start a figure, I always start with, with a rib cage. Now this is internal stuff. So the only way you can actually find that this out and understand the shape of that is either through having a model, uh, you know, a, a model of a skeleton, an actual skeleton, which I have, uh, or you can work from uh, uh, drawings of anatomical drawings. But the shape of this thing is you find a symbol for, for a rib cage. Almost like an upside down heart. Exactly. And that's the way I kind of think of it. And to further that, if you have a spine comes down, there's a distance. Well, let's get, I'll get to that in a minute. The pelvis is also a heart shape going this way. That you can remember. It's much more complex than that, but that's simple enough that you can use. You're going to cover it up anyway. And one of the things that I always want to tell people is there's, you know, be aware that the distance between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis, it's only about four inches. You know, if you take your thumb and put it on the bottom of your rib cage and then put your finger on the top of your, your hip, you'll see that the distance is very quite, is really quite short. Once you have that, you know, you can actually, you, you know, if you come down, if you don't realize that, then you can get these kinds of, uh, distortions where you get too much distance in here. Not important at this point. But so I'm going to run this back here. Like so we have on the back of we we have short we know our shoulder blades. Actually I'm going to turn it I'm going to put a head on here. Let's do this. I'm going to we're looking at this figure now from the back. We have shoulder blades that look like wings. So somebody told me, gave me a tip one time on this show. Uh -huh. um, if you're looking, if you're creating a figure in a painting and you want it to look like it's from the back, don't show much neck. If you're looking at it from the oh, front, you show more, more neck. You know, a lot of people who want to throw, and watercolors do this all the time, and I paint with some watercolors. You know, you can paint a little figure you know, you'll see them do this, you know, where they, or let's see, there's another, you know, you can find little, little notation, little shorthands for figures. That's one way to do it. And you can put that in, but if you want to take it a little further, you know, we, we, you have to know a little bit about what's underneath. And it's simple from here. You got upper arm, lower arm and a hand, upper arm, lower arm, which is two bones of radius and the ulna. And then you've got a hand, you got the and upper the leg. Elbows, by the way, I've noticed the elbows kind of right, go right to the edge of the rib cage. Right here. Yeah, they line up pretty much right here. Yeah. The leg and for measurement purposes, uh, the leg is typically three heads, one, two, three, and the arms are typically two heads. 
One, two. You with me on that? So that's a head high. And this is a head. You can get three heads in a, in a leg. You got the lower leg and then you got a foot. Lower leg and a foot. It's basically a stick figure. So the only parts we're going to be dealing with is we're going to be working with upper arms, lower arms, hands, upper leg, lower leg, feet, um, rib cage, pelvis, and head, and uh, on our shoulder blades. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this figure, we're going to wipe him down, just kind of make a mental note of him, and I'm going to put him in down on all fours. We don't travel on all fours, but animals do. But we are a four-legged animal. I'm going to put in the spine. Now, from the side, our our rib cage has a. It's our rib cage is squat. An animal's rib cage typically is more robust and uh, is elongated this way. In other words, the side is longer and it's shorter going in the depth. You know, from the from the from the top, our rib cage looks like this, and an animal's rib cage is more ovoid in this way. So, now I know there's some of you out there are thinking, well, okay, well, well, yeah, well, where are we going with this? Just stick with me. It's gonna help. So, uh, the pelvis, again, the distance here and here is pretty close. From the side, it's you, you, again. You have if you look at drawing or at uh, uh, diagrams, you can find a shape that you can learn how to draw. The leg is going to come off here. This is the upper leg. This is the lower leg, and this is the foot. And our shoulder blades are sit. They sit on top of our rib cage. This would be in the ribs, and the shoulder joint is right here. The upper upper arm, lower arm. And a hand and our heads unfortunately we are not made to be like this where we've gone long ways from the monkey stage and our spine comes out of the bottom of our skull so we typically will look down when we're on all fours And then once you have that structure in there, then you just have to cover it up with the blanket. Now you may not get the contours exactly right, but you've got something to build it on. And that's the whole point of this discussion. And the muscles of the gluteus comes here, down the leg, down the arm. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that is again, it's something we're familiar with because we carry it with us all the time. If we had a tail, if we had a tail, our spine comes down here, our tail actually ends, we do have a tail, the coccyx bone is right here. But if it was continued out, we'd have a tail like that. In our old, in the old ancestral days, that's what we had. So what I wanna do is, I'm gonna come up here, I'm going to build a horse. I'm going to build it based on this. And you'll see how it, it actually builds itself. So I'm going to start with a rib cage again. Well, first I'm going to start with a, I'm going to put spine and spine on a horse is about like this. Now, how do I know that? Because I've looked it up and I've practiced it. Uh, you know, it's anytime we're painting something, you know, there, there's, there's always this idea that, well, you just buy some paints and go out and paint things. Well, there is a certain amount of uh, knowledge that we need to gain as we go. If we want to, if we want to move up the ladder in some way, uh, you know, we have to do. There's study involved, just like anything else. If you were learning uh, to play an instrument, you have to study the instrument and un and understand how to read music and that sort of thing. Uh, drawing and painting is the same way. Uh, it takes a certain little bit amount of uh, uh, energy and and. Uh, uh, desire to get out there and actually find out some things. So anyway, the uh, spine on a horse has a little bit of a curve to it. And you're thinking, okay, no, the, the, the contour of a horse, it does this like that. It actually curves this way, not this way. Well, it actually does curve this way. 
the uh, vertebra, the reason it has this, this point right here, which is the withers, uh, there are these spines coming off of the, off the vertebra. And then there's also this, this in the rump area, there's also a series here. So we're gonna put in the, the rib cage, which is about this shape. One of the things that I try to do is uh, I, I have a mantra that it doesn't have to be accurate. It just has to be believable. The more accurate it is, the more believable it is, of course. The, uh, now we're going to put in the pelvis. The pelvis of a, of a horse is shaped like, I, I like to think of it like a lazy L. And right here in the center of it, that's where the leg's going to attach. Now the... Uh, uh, the arm's going to attach to the scapula. Remember I said that the scapula on the, on the human is right here. It sits right on top of your back. Well, on a horse, it's a little different. It is this, it's shaped like, like a wedge. Wipe that out just a little bit. The reason they call it a shoulder blade is because it is shaped like a blade. In fact, in the old, olden times, they used to make plows out of horse, horse shoulder blades. Fascinating. Nice big flat bone. From that, then you have, we're going to do the upper arm, which is on the, uh, on the human. It's just, it also comes off. This is the shoulder of a horse. So you have, a, this is the humerus or the upper, upper, upper arm. And right here is the elbow. That's this elbow. There's a, there's a bone that sticks out here. It's called the acromion process. And it, uh, uh, what it does is it keeps the keeps your lower arm from from extending back this way. It can only go this way, uh, and a horse will have it too. And the thing that you can look at as far as where does this go? Does it go here? Does it go here? It lines up pretty much with the scapula. This 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 direct this angle right here is kind of an important angle, and most of us know it's there. We just don't know why it's there. Wipe that out just a little bit. Paper towel. There's the upper arm, and the lower arm is going to come down here and to about this point. And what that is, that is the wrist. This is the wrist of the horse. We think of the leg on a horse as being. You know, it comes out, you know, the horse's body here and it comes out and we think that's the whole leg. And this is the, and this is, uh, this is where the foot is. The foot actually starts here. Uh, it's, you know, it's a evolutionary change. Uh, so when you have the upper arm, then you have the lower arm, it comes to here, which is the same as this in comparison. Then from here on down, this is foot. And these are the, the, Carpal, what are known as carpal bones. I'm going to wipe. I'm going to take his take his tail out just for the moment. I want to get that leg in there. So from here, there's a bone here, there's a bone here, and then there's a hoof. A horse stands on one toe. We could do the same thing, but we have five toes or five fingers. We have five toes. When we get to the horse's uh, back leg, you'll see that it also stands on one toe. All right, so what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna draw him back in. We're gonna draw this bone, which is this bone. It's a femur bone. We'll just call it the uh, upper leg bone. The, the, the upper, upper arm and the upper leg will kind of line up. So you can, that gives you some sort of reference. And also, usually this is going to line up about there with, with the uh, edge of the rib cage. Now, obviously, if I have the rib cage too big, then that's going to move it all back. But it'll, it'll, it'll still work out. And then you have the lower, the lower leg here. It's going to do the same, roughly the same angle. And then we're going to have the foot. Now, the foot on a horse... Here, we're gonna do this too. I wanna to draw this line across here where the wrist is on the horse. This is wrist. Remember, this is the wrist, not the knee. 
This is the elbow. This is the wrist. I'm going to draw a line across here just so I can find out where, where is this going to intersect with a foot bone. And you see this bone here that sticks up. There's a tendon that hooks to that. We have the same thing on our bodies, our heel bone. This is the heel bone on the horse. And then it has a bone here, which is basically, it's a tarsal bone, which is a foot bone. Then you have a toe, toe here. You with me so far? I'm with you so far. All right. Good deal. All right. Now, uh, let's get rid of whatever this was. All right. I'm going to show everybody. I've just put a picture of a horse skeleton on it. You can buy them online. An actual, an actual horse skeleton, only $15,000. I don't yes. know if you know the, the story about Dan Sprick, but he's... Yeah, he you know that story? Dead. What? You know that story? Yeah, finding the dead horse and yeah. boiling yeah. it down and rebuilding a skeleton. Yep, yep, yeah. I, uh, yeah, if I ever find a dead horse, I'm doing exactly the same thing, but I'm into that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I could really appreciate that. Uh, let's uh, put in the neck. The next, the next neck part of the spine for this horse, we're just going to put it there because I'm running out of space. I'd actually like a little higher, but that's all right. Uh, all all uh, mammals have uh, a seven vertebra, cervical vertebra. That means from the head down to the shoulder. Uh, that's just that's just knowledge that you can use at a at a cocktail party. Um, humans have it. Giraffes have it. Doesn't matter the length of the neck. There's just going to be seven cervical. Uh, vertebra, except for three animals, and that's the manatee and the two-toed sloth and the three-toed sloth. Don't know why they're different, but they are. And uh, again, just information to take to a party. I'd never get invited okay. back if I start talking about that stuff. <laughs> sometimes, you know. Well, maybe sometimes I'll get you out of a party. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, my my great line if so, if I'm in a not in a mood to talk when I'm on an airplane, yeah, um, I will. Um, they'll say, "Well, what do you do for a living?" I'll say, "Well, I'm an in insurance. Are you covered?" And they'll never say another word. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that one in mind. So anyway, all right. So a, a couple things that I want to point out too, uh, and I'm not I'm not writing this down. You don't have to take notes. You don't have to. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a test, but. Just some things, this is a general thing to understand is that a horse's body will actually fit not not the neck and the head, but just from the shoulder at the at the at the farthest point and the leg, let's say the end of the pelvis here, will fit in a square. And you can check yourself if you if you think your your horse is too long or too short. You can check it by saying, okay, let's put a let's put a box around it and let's see. So I can measure that from the width. Okay, so that's my width. Yeah, maybe his legs are just a little too long. That's all right. It's not that far off. You know Tim Oliver, right? Yeah. He's a guy, good yeah. buddy of mine that we paint together. He was he was down in uh, San Angelo, Texas several years ago and he was doing a quick paint. And uh, you know, he's a watercolorist and uh he did this painting. I don't remember what was all in there, there but there was a horse in there, and he uh, he won a prize. But his horse was it was a bit like this, if you can imagine. It was a little bit better better horse than that, but uh, but it was very long. And he said, "Ma, my horse." I you know I was congratulating him. He said, "Yeah, my horse was too long." I said, "Well, the judge didn't care." He said, well, but I thought, you know, I said, I just said, you know, why don't you put a couple, another set of uh, legs in that horse? It would be a much better horse. But if he had put it into a box, he would have seen that. In fact, he could have just taken it and made, made, maybe make the legs longer. One of the things that uh, I used to joke about was if I'm drawing a I'm drawing a, a horse in a field and it ends up looking like a goat. And I'll just say, well, that's a goat painting. So, you, you know, you're going through a lot of, you're putting the un, under uh, structure in first, but if you're out in the, 
the field and you're painting fast, do you go to all that trouble or do you just no, kind of know, not. here's the no, shape? No, I'm gonna show you real, I can show you real quick what I do do. Uh, all right. Once, once you understand there's this, this kind of thing going on, once you understand that, then when you're in the field, you can lock in a, uh, a, um, a rib cage and you've got a, you've got a uh, pelvis, you've got a leg here, you got a leg here, you got a leg here, you've got, there's a, you know, the um, uh, shoulder blade here, you've got the, the upper arm, then you've got the lower arm, you've got a neck, and you've got this. And then you can build your horse pretty quickly. The other thing, whether they, that's not a very good one. Let's try another one. Put in that just as a flat shape. You're going to have the leg comes here. How, how's that showing? That's showing up all right. Yeah. Yeah. And your neck. And that. And it's also valuable, let's say you take a horse and you say, what would it look like if it was on its back haunches? If you've ever looked at Frederick Remington paintings, you know, he'll often, but particularly in his, in his uh, uh, sculptures, you know, he'll have put a horse up on its hind legs. Well, you can do that fairly easy. Again, if you understand, start, always start with the rib cage. Pelvis, upper leg, lower leg, and the foot. And then you got the, the arm. And in this case, instead of coming down like this, you're going to put those, you're going to have that. This is the upper arm, this is the lower arm, and the hand. And then you got a horse. And then the back leg in, it's going to do pretty much the same thing. So that's kind of how the, you know, how we want to apply this. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's simplified. To simplify that even more, uh, just take that, that, this this uh, diagram here, you can learn how to do it fairly quickly, and this is how I do it. You know, I'll put in that, and I know there's a pelvis here, it's upper leg, lower leg, so we come here. Uh, I need to know that that scapula is there, upper arm, and it comes down, and then the arms, uh, the uh, neck's going to come up here, and I'm going to put in. Put in the head, and then you can fill in the contours. Now, at this point, you can make chut, and then you can then you can actually then look if a horse happens to come back into the field or it comes close enough that you can you can start looking and saying, okay, now that I've got a structure to build on, now I can look at this contour and see if there's a way for me to make it more uh, structurally sound and that is coming because we know what is inside of it that actually looks like a camel <laughs> and that's all it takes and actually if you wanted to make it into a giraffe this is where it gets fun giraffe i don't know what a giraffe head looks like it's kind of like a horse, but it's, I know it's not. It comes down. Its body is a little shorter. I know that. So we're going to leave this front, arm, the front leg, front arm, front leg. We're going to put the pelvis here, which means that's going to move this leg forward a little bit. I'm going to get rid of this. And it's got, remember I was talking about these processes right here for the withers, which is the, the, the high point on a, on a horse's uh, back. Uh, I know that a giraffe has them too, but they're very, they're very big. That's why you get a giraffe looks like this. A giraffe is actually a horse. Everything is a horse. And you end up with a horse with a, with a giraffe. And then without having really, I don't really know what a giraffe looks like, but I can pull one off. I don't know what the tail is. Just assume that it looks like this. So if someone says, again, you're at that same party where the same, you know, you, you're trying to impress people and you say, I know how to draw a giraffe. You can right, so, make it. Okay, now we're gonna do a lightning round. I want you okay. to erase, I want you to erase everything. Everything? 
Everything. You got it. All right. Then we're going to do a lightning round. We're going to see how good you really are. We're going to test you. Make sure you put a chicken in there if you would. Everybody well, that, it'll seem if I do that now, it's going to seem rigged. All right. Let me shoot. Okay. Now this is up to the comments. The people in the comments, you got to tell me what what you want Lon to do a quick drawing of. Okay, uh, Rhino. All right, Rhino. Again, we're going to start. We're going to start with. And I don't know what a Rhino looks like. I mean, I know what it looks like, but I've never drawn one. We're going to start okay, well, with that's the spine. Why we're doing this. I know. All right, so we're going to put there. A rhino is fairly robust, a little bit like a cow, so it's going to have a little bit more, uh, a little bit more full um, uh, rib cage. I would guess that it probably it's also like a bit of a, like a pig. So uh, and we're gonna we're just gonna pretty much go with the same uh, pelvis. And yeah, this crowd is getting tough. Now they're what? talking about aardvarks and oh. <laughs> llamas. <laughs> <laughs> have them ask for a whale i can do a whale but it's a, it's the same structure okay we've got a, we got the uh you know, we've got the pelvis we got an upper leg we got a lower leg we got a foot and then we've got uh, a shoulder blade we're gonna have the upper arm and i think they probably they have fairly short legs very full robust legs and I would think that their neck is like a cow. A horse can do this. A horse's neck can do this. A cow really can't do that. It's shorter and it's gonna really kind of run downhill. So we're gonna put, I'm gonna put a cow skull on it just because I don't know what a rhino uh, skull looks like. Although I would assume that it's long, it's fairly long. And it's probably got a pretty good sized jaw. Maybe not quite that big. All right, let's flesh that baby out and see what we got. I think the ears go this way, like a horse. It's going to be, and I know it's got, I know it has a bit of a hump here, and I think it has a hump on its rump. It goes here. Oh, oh. It goes down like this. And I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty thick through here. And it's good. Golly, I, I would again like a cow. I think it probably goes like this. And you know, we know that it has, of course, it has a horn here. Okay, now look at your screen. That was a pretty good guess. Oh, yeah, you see that. Look, it has here's one thing it has it has these spines, they're way up there. Okay, that's good. Almost like a, uh, a buffalo has that. All right, so let's just and we'll just kind of flesh that out. We've got we got a muscle that goes this way, muscle goes this way, got a muscle coming down the leg, and then we've got muscle coming off of off the rump, which comes around to the lower leg. And we got this one coming to the upper leg. And then we've got, I think this one's too squat. I think probably this needs to be back here. Okay, so we tested you with one you don't know. Okay, we're gonna do a quick test from the comments. We need a cat. A cat. Well, now we get into it. Okay. This is good because this tells me what I don't know. Yeah. I will tell you right now, I don't know a cat. However. Well, would you rather we, do an alligator or no, a honey badger? No, no. Let's see if we can do a cat <laughs> based on, on what we know here. Let's say you want to draw a cat. I know that it's going to have more of a curved spine because a cat moves more more it has more agility because of that curved spine than uh uh a cow or a horse uh i don't know what scapula looks like on a on a cat but we're going to guess that hey, uh, you I've got actually, one, you got one minute to do a cat and then we're going to run out of time okay well how much time do we have well we're going to have a save room for one more animal but you got one right. minute on a cat all right well then i'm not going to talk i'm just going to do it all right Okay. You guys, they're a tough crowd, man. They're coming up with all kinds of things in the yeah. in the chat. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to do now something that will make this easy for you. Okay. That looks like a cat. Now let's do a bird. Okay. Let's do a bird. Let's do a check. Okay. Most birds are the same. 
Again, we're going to start with with rib cage. Got a spine. The spine on a bird comes up at the shoulder here. It's going to go up like so. The uh, the uh, pelvis on a on a bird is flat. Typically does this. It has a long upper leg. It's a shorter lower leg. And then you've got, like I said, three feet. And the arm on a on a on a chicken, usually a chicken is folded up. You got upper arm, lower arm, and then you've got the hand. But we're gonna put it up as if it's ready to fly. It's gonna have an upper arm, lower arm, and a hand. The hand on a chicken is the fingers are fused, but it does have a thumb. And it does have a humerus and an ulna. The way that works is if you had a wing, now let's just put a, let's go ahead and put a head on this thing. And that is a bird. All and of course, right. there's a key over here. Now, real quick, I can turn this into, we know that chickens, uh, birds are dinosaurs. We're going to take this wing off. Instead of coming, then we're going to come off the shoulder. We're going to have an arm, the upper arm, lower arm. Now we're going to give it claws instead of a wing. And what we end up with is a velociraptor. Well, we've been eating dinosaurs all this time. I had no idea. Dinosaurs. All right. Okay. We're out of time. You come back on, on hey, camera so we can see you. <laughs> Here I am. Well, this is fun. Our guest today is Lon Brower. Lon, this has been very helpful. Uh, now, every time we see a cow or a pig or a rhinoceros, we're going to be thinking about the rib cage as the starting point. You're going to be thinking about that ladder back chair that's inside that, that animal. So That's yeah. right. I hope well, so. Now, I now hope we're so. going to have to get anatomy books. and uh, It's not and, that hard. Really is. It's just you got to learn. You got to learn some things. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, easy, to, easy to find online. All right. Well, Lon, thank you so much for doing this today. And I want to congratulate you on the new video. And again, tell people that it's out there at uh, painttube.tv. And uh, it's really terrific. It's called Abstract Figure Painting. And he did this from a photo, which is also kind of fun to see how he did that. So uh, that is on video now, and you can find it at painttube.tv. Just search his name, Lon, L-O-N, and you'll find it. Hey, thanks, Eric. This has been great. I've been, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, you know, this, yeah. this is so much fun for, for me to see. Every single day, there's, a, there's something that we all learn. You know, at, in, if you go to a traditional art school, and I'm not dissing that by any stretch, but they have to kind of build things in modules, or the lowest common denominator because you got 60 people in the class and this is compressed learning. So this is an opportunity to learn a lot of little tidbits every day. This was a good one. Well, keep in mind that, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we can go to school or not go to school, but we, we have to ultimately learn this stuff on our own yeah. and uh, we can pick up tidbits and, and we can put it in the, you know, like I said in the video, it's a casserole in our heads and we just got to keep filling it up. Yeah. So we, we need everybody to do a, do a drawing of an animal with their skeleton and then post it so we can see it. That'd be cool. I'd like to see that. All right, yeah. Lon, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today. All right. You have a great right. day. Hi, I'm Lon Brower. I'm a painter of both figure and plein air landscape, and I'm from Grand City, Illinois. In this video, you're going to see that something as complex as a figurative photo reference can be broken down into basic shapes. And once you can do that and you can see those, then transferring that to a, to a surface and making a painting is going to be a whole lot easier. You know, my approach to oil painting is this. I, uh, I'm very much about experimentation and I'm also a, a very aggressive painter. Uh, I like to put paint on with big brushes and move it around. Uh, for me, paint is more important than subject. It's the paint and how the paint is interacting and moving around with brushes and other tools. In the end, we come up with a representational image. A couple things that I want, I'm hoping that you can pull away from this video. One is that painting is a journey, not a destination. And what I mean by that is the, the 
the time that we spend making a painting is as, as important as the end result. In fact, I like to think of the end result as a byproduct, not an end product. So in other words, you paint, you paint, you paint, and at the end, if you're lucky, you'll get something you can put on the refrigerator. That's one thing. The second thing is, I think that we need to build memory. Painting is about building memory. So it's building experiences, and we put those experiences in our head as memory, and then we can take that and we can pull up things. So when we're, when we're working on, say, a figure painting, we can bring in all this other information that we've, brought, you know, that we've, we've built over the years, how to drive a car, how to, how to bake an apple pie, all these kinds of things. You think, well, they're, they're way, uh, they have nothing to do with that. Yes, they do. It's all up here, and we're, we've got this casserole in our heads, and we, we need to keep adding things to it. And the more we add to it, the more we have to draw from when we make a painting. So, we're going to make some paintings, and uh, we're going to be pushing a lot of stuff around, and we're going to take this journey together. I think you're going to enjoy it. I think they're going to learn a lot. I think it's going to really enhance what it is you know now. And like I said before, you're going to be putting stuff into the casserole and it's just going to get better and better and better.